speaking seminar. Uh, and we are extremely happy and lucky to have Udi Shapiro joining us today. And uh, let me just give you a few words about, um, uh, about the event. Uh, people, uh, some people are in person and some people are remotely on Zoom, including myself right this moment. And uh, people can simply raise their hands, obviously, in the audience for questions. Those on Zoom can type their questions on the Q&A at the bottom of the control panel. And Udi will uh, answer, I guess, as many as possible, uh, probably during the Q&A session after his lecture. Um, about our theory uh, of computing uh, seminar series, um, well, you're all in the Simons uh, Institute, you probably know it, but just to repeat, uh, we have been there since 2012 due to a generous uh, gift from the Simons Foundation. We are a place for collaborative research, bringing together computer scientists and others to study theory of computation and its connection to the world. And uh, I think that today's lecture is an incredible example of the connection of uh, theory of computation, cryptography actually, uh, distributed computing and democracy. And uh, our distinguished speaker today is Udi Shapira, who's a professor in Weizmann Institute, and I think he's visiting Columbia Institute right now, in Columbia University right now. He is a truly in this, this interdisciplinary scientist, entrepreneur, artist, and political activist. He's worked in uh, works that have made a giant impact on biology, on uh, economics, and on uh, sort of the, our infrastructure. He got his uh, BA from Tel Aviv in mathematics and philosophy, his PhD from Yale, and he's been with the, with the Weizmann Institute ever since, where he's the Harry Weinreb uh, prof uh, Professorial Chair of Computer Science and Biology. And he's worked on uh, logic programming, algorithmic debugging, um, uh, biology, um, sort of coming up with a, um, a biological computer, uh, and today he's going to tell, the, tell us about his views about, uh, I guess, blockchains, foundation of democracy, and uh, his activities in the field. I think uh, this has started since uh, 2017, his work in this field, and he even founded a new Israeli political party called Democratit. Uh, he's also a um, bass singer and a founder of an, an artistic director of Baroque Band, <laughs> and maybe he'll tell us about it. In any case, I am really happy to welcome Udi to the Simons Institute and uh, go for it, Udi. Uh, let's take the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Shafi, for, for this kind introduction. Uh, it's a, it's a great to be here and thanks for the invitation. And it's great uh, to give a talk in person to real people. So there are real people in the audience, some of them I know and love, so that's, uh, that's great. And uh, as a special treat to the people here, if you have questions during the talk, uh, uh, I'll try to answer them. Uh, but otherwise, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, try to answer questions at the end. So uh, uh, the work is joint work with uh, my colleagues and uh, students, uh, Nimrod Talmon, uh, Gal Shachaf, Uri Pupko, and uh, several other colleagues, which I will uh, mention uh, during the talk. And. Uh, the first question that may come to mind is, uh, you know, why why this doesn't work? That's the first question. Okay. Uh, see. Okay. So this works. Oh, no, it's uh, the the computer doesn't doesn't switch the slides for some reason. Itself. Again. Works. Okay. So the first question is why talk about this hype field, uh, futuristic uh, concept of, of uh, a metaverse in such a respectable, to such a respectable audience? And my personal answer, uh, is one of them, is uh, nostalgia. So uh, I went uh, uh, through the web and collected uh, 25 years old uh, screenshots of my happy days in, in the metaverse uh, from 1995, six and seven. And what you see here is a two dimensional metaverse where these uh, are, are avatars to the icons of people who are in this web page, visiting this web page virtually. And they can talk and, uh, and chat and uh, 
They can even tour the web together. So there is a notion of a tour bus. Here's a tour dri bus driver and people can hop on the bus and tour the web together, which, which we did. Uh, here's a bus with several people on board. And uh, uh, we had live events. So here's an AOL hosted live event. Here's the host, here's the guest, here's some of the audience. Uh, and uh, Excite hosted uh, um, uh, this community. At, at its peak, it had uh, several tens of thousands of people uh, at the time, some with a real identity, some kept their anonymous identity. And uh, you could play games, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the happy days of, of uh, Metaverse uh, 25 years ago. And uh, this is actually the product of uh, what we see is a virtual places uh, 1.0, 2.0, which it was launched in 1995. Same day as Netscape uh, 1.0, if people are old enough to remember. 10, days be 10 years before Facebook. And it was done by Ubik, a company I founded in uh, 1993. So that's the nostalgia part. But uh, a more uh, substantial, uh, substantial reason to, to talk about uh, the metaverse is I really think it's the right integrative concept for where we're headed. So ignore whether it's 1D or 2D or 3D, the idea of integrative digital space that we will all we are all inhabiting and will inhabit inhabit um, uh, more and more deeply in the future metaverse is, is a good word for it and uh, so let's try to define it at least for the purpose of this talk and I, I opt for a very simple definition it's just a network of digital communities you know it could be uh, as I said I don't care about the dimensionality at this point just it's a network of digital communities and actually we already live in a very rich metaverse. Uh, these are the uh, social networks and the, the first seven each has more than billion uh, uh, users or members, but we shouldn't forget other digital communities, the community of, of hosts and guests, guests of Airbnb, community of drivers and passengers of Uber, community of buyers and sellers of Amazon and Marketplace, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we already live in a rich, uh, metaverse, uh, which will only become richer and, and deeper and will spend more and more time there. And uh, really there are three possible futures for our lives in this uh, digital, uh, our digital lives in, in the metaverse. Uh, one is democracy, which we all know and love and can be characterized by, by one person, one vote. It's just part of the characterization, but it's an important one. Autocracy, which maybe parodically can be characterized by one person has all votes. An example is Meta, Amazon, Airbnb, Uber. And uh, plutocracy, uh, where people vote with their money. So one coin is one vote. And I think almost the entire crypto world can be characterized as a plutocratic. And I'll, I'll get deeper into this notion of plutocracy uh, in the talk. So these are three possible futures. Uh, and as you've seen, uh, I have examples for, for autocracy and plutocracy, but I don't really uh, have good examples of, uh, of uh, digital democracy, except perhaps proof of personhood, which is the beginning of a direction on, in the crypto world. So uh, what, what's, why, why don't I have good examples? Because really the, the main part of the metaverse today is non-democratic. And specifically, if we look at history, and try to analyze what we see today in a more historical perspective, it's really a feudal system, what we have today. And what characterizes feudal system? A feudal system is that we have a feudal lord that has all branches of government, legislative, executive, and judiciary. And if you look at the, especially in, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, blatant in social networks that uh, Facebook decides both of what are the rules, they execute the rules, they judge by the rules, etc. So, uh, but, but in all these uh, examples I've given, these are all autocracies, uh, feudal systems specifically in that sense. Another aspect of, of the feudal system is that the members have no civil rights. Uh, there's no due process. You cannot truly appeal or, or have, have rights uh, of any sort. And also for the Americans among us, uh, we keep being subject to taxation without representation. Our 
digital capital or personal information is taken from us, taken from us and is being exploited without remuneration. And we work, we look at ads, we create content and we get, get no money for that. So a good cause for rebellion. Uh, so let's, let's look at, at slightly greater depth at the powers that are shaping the, the future of the, of the metaverse. And there are really two big classes, uh, uh, powerful and, 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 and dominant classes. One is the autocratic one and the other is the plutocratic, the meta and the crypto metaverses. And here we have proprietary technology, trillion, more than trillion dollars behind it, hundreds of thousands of programmers developing this for the different companies, thousands of researchers or uh, in, in, the, in all these big companies uh, together, and several billionaires who are, who, are pushing, who are pushing this. So that's one direction with a lot of money and a lot of power, and including huge brain power. I'm not, there's a lot of brain power that invested in, in, in perfecting the autocratic metaverse. And, and uh, of course, Zuckerberg, you know, uh, stated that he will invest even more explicitly in this autocratic metaverse. On the other side of the equation, we have a plutocratic uh, team, uh, uh, the, the crypto team. So the technology is not quite proprietary, but it's not free either. And you either need Either some of it is, is proprietary, and in general, to participate, you need the capital, a lot of capital. So it's not, it's not open in, in that sense. It's not open to ordinary people. Um, and there's, again, huge amount of uh, money and programmers and a, a huge amount of research that's going on behind uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies uh, today. Probably there are thousands of patents being processed as we speak in the cryptocurrency uh, Bitcoin uh, blockchain uh, world uh, right now. And also a lot of rich people who want to push this uh, even further. So these are, you know, so let's lump them together, okay? Uh, uh, and put both of them on the right. So we have lots of money, lots of people, lots of brain power. And what do we have for a democratic metaverse? Well, first of all, uh, really any technology that should be developed for that fundamentally has to be a common good. You know, otherwise it's self-defeating. It will become yet another autocratic or plutocratic domain. So if you want it to be truly, truly democratic, it has to be common good, which means it can be funded or either by governments or by, by philanthropic organizations or individuals. Uh, it cannot be for profit. Uh, but so that's the sort of the difficult part. The good part is that there are really 8 billion people around who, who are gonna benefit from it. So if you look on this side, those who will directly benefit will become in, in a better shape. Uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, million, two million, ten million people tops, you know, will become richer and better off if the non-democratic metaverse dominates our lives. But on the left-hand side, you know, there are eight billion people out there waiting for for this to to better their lives. But presently, there's no money, and I would like to say, you know, I, uh, I, not disrespecting the science that has been done in this. I mean. Lots of good science has been done, but if you compare it to the brain power invested in, in uh, cloud computing, in uh, Microsoft research, uh, Google research, Amazon, Facebook research, and cryptocurrencies research, compared to the amount of science that's being done behind democratic metaverse, you can say that there is almost no science there, uh, at least quantitatively. So uh, maybe, Rather than trying to do this impossible and do science for democratic metaverse without support, without money, maybe you can just work hard on a few people, you know, the, the board of Facebook, maybe Zuckerberg himself and his wife, convince them that the right thing is to turn Facebook into a democracy and this, this will solve our problem. So, uh, so can this be done? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, okay, what do I mean by that? I mean that to make Facebook members owned and, and governed, okay? so give it to the public, to the, to the members, and uh, have members re uh, remunerated for their digital capital and for, for their labor. Okay, so that's, that's, let's, let's do that. Let's convince a few people. If we convince them, we're done, right? At least made a huge step. Well, the answer is that even if you convince them and they decide they cannot. And the answer, and the reason is that the difficulty facing digital democracy or democratic metaverse 
is not the money and power of the alternatives, but it's the enemy from within. And that's the fake uh, and duplicate identities. So what Facebook does every quarter, they delete over a billion fake and duplicate accounts every quarter. So, uh, and sometimes more, sometimes 2 billion. So uh, we don't know how quickly they do it. We don't know how successful they are, but it's, it's reasonable to assume that at least half the accounts in Facebook are fake or duplicate. And if Facebook were to give power and money to, the, to its members, uh, you know, they'll be hard pressed to keep, uh, you know, to keep the, that percent uh, below 99%, okay? Because there will be so much more motivation to create fake and duplicate accounts. And we call technically the name for this is uh, Sybils. And the reason is a book that was published in the 70s and created a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of noise in the general public and the psycho psychotherapy circles. Uh, it's about Sybil, which is the true story of a woman possessed by 16 different personalities. That's why we call them Sybils. Uh, the only problem with this story, uh, well, two problems. Actually, first, uh, Sybil is not her true name. And second, the story is not true. So, uh, so what you should remember really is that Sybils are fake and duplicate. Okay, and they're they're bad. They're the they're, they're the key challenge to to democratic uh, metaphors. Not not the power and the money of, of the alternatives, but but addressing this problem. And that's the key key scientific problem that that needs to be addressed. And this will, in some sense, this will be the the anchor of of uh, my talk. Okay, so that's the introduction. Let's see, uh, and so we can actually dive into the talk the talk itself. So we're going to talk about foundations for democratic metaverse, but but even that is is an overreach. Uh, so there are uh, social, political, legal foundations that need to be addressed. I will not address them. I will talk only about computational foundations for democratic metaverse, which is an important component, but definitely not the only component need, that needs to be addressed. And second, I will not try to design a democratic metaverse top down from from scratch, but rather focus on a problem with which in technical sense it could be simpler but it's in other sense it's more intellectually challenging and and, and from a scientific uh, perspective more difficult and that's to to design the, uh, to afford the grassroots formation of a democratic metaverse so we want to build the infrastructure scientific conceptual mathematical and eventually software that will enable a democratic metaverse to emerge democratically in a grassroots way so that's the focus. That's the true topic of the talk. Okay, so let's define what a democratic metaverse uh, there is. Uh, you had a question? No. Okay. So let's define what a democratic uh, uh, metaverse uh, is. Uh, to a first approximation, all we need to do is add the word egalitarian equality. Okay, so democratic metaverse is a network of egalitarian digital communities. And if we want to expand it a little bit more, uh, we can talk about members owned, members operated, and members governed uh, egalitarian digital communities. And conceptually, it's nice to, to split these into, into two, two broader categories, uh, autonomous communities and democratic communities. And these are really two aspects of equality. Autonomous protects equality from without, okay? so. We protect the equality of the community against outside intervention or, or, or forces that can hamper equality. And democracy protects equality from within, so shares power equally inside. So these are two aspects of being egalitarian. So I view autonomous and democratic as two aspects of being egalitarian, which is the key, the key uh, topic. Okay, and I should add that uh, all, all I'm going to talk about is. Uh, uh, all the papers are available on the archive. If you search my, uh, my name, uh, the papers I'm, I'm a co-author with are all are all on the archive. Uh, but I'll quote, uh, I'll mention them as, as we go. Uh, okay. There's one word which we sort of neglected, which is grassroots. So we don't see here grassroots. So let's add it. And there are two ways to add, uh, to add this point. One is to put it here. It's a network of grassroots egalitarian digital communities. 
actually I'd like to put it in a different place. I'd like to put it here. So it's a grassroots network of, of egalitarian digital communities because uh, we would like to build the foundations that even the network itself, the network of the communities can emerge in a grassroots fashion. And I will talk towards the end about what, what is needed to, to enable grassroots network formation. Okay, so that's, that'll be our, our working definition. And really everything I'm gonna talk about in the talk is about making this, what is the basic science, computer science that is needed, missing or needed or has been done already partially, uh, or at least proof of concept or initial basic science uh, to enable dem a democratic metaverse thus defined. So let's start with the most pressing question, which is how can you achieve uh, democratic governance, especially since uh, we already said that our democratic our communities will be infested with Sibyls. What, what can we do? So if the Sibyls are more than 51% and we use majoritarian decisions, then we're, we're dead in the water. I mean, Sibyls control us and, and there's nothing that the real people can do about that. But even if there is only a single Sibyl, we're in trouble because if the decisions are majoritarian, then a single Sibyl can change the vote from yes to no or no to yes or et cetera. So even in a simple majoritarian decision-making, even a single Sibyl can hamper democracy and, and make our results not trustworthy. So what can be done? Well, some work has been done uh, uh, in the context of social choice theory uh, by Konitzer and others, uh, which primarily showed negative results uh, that not, not much can be done. And, and, and pointed some, some direction to, to the future, to success. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a different direction, which is not starting from ordinary social choice theory, but from a variant of it, which is called reality aware social choice. And we will see reality emerge over and over. You know, it's always good to be aware of reality as a general rule. And it turns out that technically it also helps in this context. And especially in the context of the, the uh, democratic metaverse, as computer scientists, we want to kind of think about the closed, about the computational system that can be formally defined, but the whole notion of equality and democracy or the notion of democracy, which requires equality is always in tension between, it, 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 between the computational world and the real world, because the only meaning of equality is as it relates to real people, not to computational entities. So we'll always see this interplay between computation and reality. So reality aware social choice says there is reality, uh, it's status quo, and it's always there. You cannot vote on something without having reality as one of the alternatives. And it turns out it has uh, nice things uh, you can resolve. It has nice properties, but specifically it helps us with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, civil resilience. And this should have popped one by one. So, uh, uh, I'll still talk about it one by one. The animation was lost. So Sybil resilient reality where social choice introduces two notions, uh, safety and liveness, which together form Sybil resilience. And what does Sybil safety says? Sybil safety says that we, the real people, uh, if, if we're not for a change to, to the status quo, the Sybils cannot force it on us, okay? So that's safety. No matter what the Sibyls want to do, unless the real people want to change the status quo, it will not change. That's safety. They can vote for, they can vote, vote against, doesn't matter. Only if there's a majority of the real people who want to change the status quo, it will change. That's safety. What is liveness? Liveness says that even if all the Sibyls are clinging to the status quo, the real people can still change it. Maybe they need more than simple majority. Maybe in the extreme case, they need unanimity, but they can still change it even of, if all the Sibyls cling with their claws to the, to the status quo. So that's safety and liveness and together it's resilience. And the result of, the, of this paper with Shahaf and uh, Talmon is that if the civil penetration is below a sigma, which is less or equal to one third, then a super majority decision uh, of uh, one plus sigma over two is, is both safe and live. Okay, so that's the main technical result. So basically instead of majoritarian decisions, that we do two things. First, we always vote against or for, we always vote on specifically on a change to reality. 
uh, with one alternative, the multiple alternatives, but reality is always there. And second, to change reality, we need a super majority, not a simple majority. And under these conditions that not too many symbols and we use a, super, a sufficiently large supermajority, we have safety and liveness. And we can also have a contour servo which, uh, and break contour cycles uh, if there are multiple alternatives. And also we have a median rule, which is important for parameter update because we will see a digital community has many parameters it needs to control. Uh, one of them is the, this, uh, this uh, sigma itself, but there are others. So we need the community, if we want these parameters to be controlled democratically, we need the community, the community to be able to update parameters and the standard way to update them is or to vote on parameters is the median rule. And we have a civil resilient version of, of the median rule. So this is a complete package of, uh, of civil resilient uh, social choice based on reality aware social choice, assuming that reality is, is there. Also the parameter is always an update against the current value of the parameter. It's not voting afresh on a parameter value, but should we change the parameter? So in this sense, it's reality aware. So we have sort of the beginning. There are lots of lots of more work to be done. Uh, I will uh, I will not uh, delve into it, but the, the, this is a, a first initial proof of concept that the problem can be solved in principle, and that's the civil resilient so social choice. But there's still uh, still yeah. nagging questions. Udi, hey, can I ask a question? Sure. From the void. So when you say that it's uh, grassroots, essentially, if we translate it to language that let's say cryptographers recognize, you mean that we don't know the upper, a priori the number who the participants are or what their even their number is? Is that correct? Yes, we, we want communities to grow in a grassroots fashion, and uh, I will. Uh, the next topic is is how to achieve that. But I'm just asking about the definition. It means that you don't know in advance who the participants are. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You don't know in advance, but in a, in a given community, it's whoever is in the community. Yes. Uh, okay, so two nagging questions. Uh, one is, who this, it, we said, okay, one person, one vote, civil resilience, we can vote successfully, eliminate the civils, but who decides what we vote on? And it's really a fundamental uh, uh, question of, of, of equality and democracy uh, who chooses the, ag the agenda. And we're so used to just saying, okay, one person, one vote, we're fine. But what are we voting on? Who decides? Typically it's back doors, you know, uh, back rooms, corridors, uh, discussions that, that, that uh, and are not transparent and are not uh, subject to scrutiny. And after this cooking that's happening, something is put to a vote in Congress, in, in, in referendum, in, in, in whatever. So the question is, who decides what, uh, what we vote upon? And uh, we actually spent, so it's a fundamental question of equality. And if you really want an, an egalitarian uh, democracy, you must address this in a, in a fundamental way. So we spent quite a lot of time uh, on, on, on this question. I will just touch upon it briefly because these are fairly deep uh, mathematical papers uh, with colleagues. Um, so I will just mention the, First of all, that, that it is that doing one person, one vote is not enough for equality. You really need also equality in deliberation, proposing, and, and, uh, uh, and, and voting. But the equality in, voting at, in, uh, equality in voting alone is definitely not enough. And uh, so uh, one, one paper that tries to address this uh, is uh, takes the three important domains for digital democracy, which is elections and budgeting and legislation, which is important for any democracy, but if you want to program them in a community, then these are topics that you must address in a, digit, in a, a, a living digital community, democratically. And uh, it proposes uh, that, that uh, we view social choice as both proposing and voting in a metric space. So we embed all uh, uh, all these domains in metric spaces and equate voting with proposing is putting a point in the metric space. So when you put a point in the metric space as, as a person, as a participant, you both propose it and vote for it. And we showed that you can aggregate these votes uh, and have, uh, uh, and have uh, uh, ways to, to see what is the most supported uh, alternative in a given metric space. But this does not address reality, as I said. Uh, and, and, and does not talk about deliberation. 
So, um, sorry. so it does offer a direction for unified approach for digital democracy, which integrates voting and proposing, and also uh, integrating elections and budgeting and legislation within the same conceptual framework. Which if you want to program this, you want, if you want on-chain governance, which I may have time to talk at the end or answer questions, then you really want a uniform conceptual infrastructure for programming all domains, all decision rules, you know, with a one kind of user interface, one conceptual framework, one piece of software. But it does not address the liberation or updating the status quo. And there is, oh, sorry, I, I should have said that this is with uh, Lorraine uh, Bulto from Paris. And, uh, and we have another paper with Edith Ilkin and uh, David Grossi uh, and, and, and Nimrod Talmon uh, on, uh, on how to take this approach and move it one step further to talk about really dynamic and, and living democracy. Um, how to can you integrate deliberation and uh, coalition, deliberative coalition formation to change the status quo within a metric space. Okay, so basically we take the previous paper of equating uh, voting with proposing add reality and deliberation is defined finding alternative preferred over the status quo by as many agents as possible. And we have dynamic grassroots coalition formation and conditions that guarantee deliberation to succeed under certain properties of the metric space and behavior of the agents. So that's another fairly fundamental theoretical paper. Again, a proof of concept that the vision of a unified approach to democratic decision-making, which is truly democratic, in, in which both the people deliberate, propose and vote on all topics, on all subjects in a unified and egalitarian way. So this is kind of a beginning of a proof of principle, proof of concept that this can be done. Okay, so that's who decides what to vote on. And another important question is who decides on the decision pool? Uh, for example, the supermajority delta, uh, sigma. Who, who decides what sigma uh, uh, to use and who, who, how, who decides to change it, uh, on, on, on changing it? So let's see. Ah. So do you know the story about Gödel and Einstein and Morgenstern who entered the taxi? Okay, who knows? Nobody knows. Okay, I'll tell you briefly. So it's not a joke. It's a real story. It's actually, uh, Gödel was about to uh, uh, go to the judge uh, to be admitted as a U.S. citizen. And he needed two witnesses that, uh, uh, to join him to going to the judge. So he asked uh, Einstein and Morgenstern. Uh, they were all in the uh, uh, Princeton Advanced Institute of Advanced Studies and to, to go with him to the judge as witnesses, and they agreed. And then they started discussing in the taxi what's going on. And, and Gettel says, look, I have this difficulty of, of uh, swearing to the US constitution because it has a bug. So they didn't want to hear about this. So they told him, don't dare to tell the judge that the constitution has a bug. You're supposed, you, you will not become a US citizen. So they spent their ride you know, trying to convince him. And uh, they were not sure if they were successful. But actually the first thing that the judge said was Germany was under an evil dictatorship. Fortunately, that's not possible in, Arme in America. And what Gadel promptly responded was, on the contrary, I know it can happen and I can prove it, okay? And also the judge told him, okay, I don't want to discuss it. So until today, it's a big mystery. What is the bug that Gadel found in the US constitution? Because he didn't tell Einstein, didn't tell Morgenstein, didn't tell the judge, didn't tell anybody. Nobody wanted to hear it, but there are, some speculations given what Gödel is that it's actually the rule of amending the constitution, which is not protected against being amended. So theoretically, the rule, the American constitution be, can be undermined if there is a sufficient majority, you know, of states and people and all that to uh, rescind the, the part of the constitution that talks about protecting it from being amended and then it be, can be easily amended to dictatorship or whatever we want. So that's the conjecture about the Gettel's, uh, Gettel's uh, bug in the American constitution. But that's just to say that constitutional law is very complicated or conceptually uh, as complicated as, as Gettel's theorem and, and self-modifying code and, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So, <clears throat> but we really want to address it because if we want to talk about autonomous communities, they're not subject to any external law that can resolve things. It's not like a company with bylaws. 
that can always adhere to the state law or federal law to resolve conflicts. An autonomous, an autonomous digital community <clears throat> is autonomous by definition. So it must have constitutional governance. And if it has, wants to have constitutional governance, who decides on the first constitution? You know, what is the initial constitution that is needed? You know, big, big questions. So we, we try to address uh, some of them. And actually, this is a title of a paper I really like. In the beginning, there were N agents. And excuse me for a second. It's with uh, Ben Abramovitz. And uh, we try to ask, you know, <clears throat> can we somehow design a constitution from first principles? And the inspiration was May's theorem, uh, which starts from uh, very basic axioms and says, OK, if you believe these axioms, the only decision rule that you can use is majority. So majority is not a kind of a whim of someone uh, that uh, majority is, is a logical conclusion uh, of certain axioms that anyone who looks at them would say, yes, these are good axioms. So we try to do the same and came up with a set of nice basic axioms, which I will not repeat here but due to lack of time, but uh, it's on the archive, as I said, and also published. Uh, so we found a set of axioms that together imply that the only initial constitution you can use is what's called the H rule, okay? And I, I believe some of you are familiar with the H index, okay? It's every, every scientist has an H index, which is the maximal number of articles it has, the maximal H articles it has, which are cited at least H times, okay? So that's a very nice and good measure. So the H rule is, is similar. An H rule is the maximal H supermajority which has eight supermajority support to change the status quo, including the constitution itself, okay? So if there is unanimous support for changing the constitution only unanimously, so if everybody agrees that all decisions should be unanimous, then it's unanimity. But it's enough that one person doesn't agree for unanimity, then you cannot use unanimity because there's no unanimous support for unanimity. If there are two thirds, uh, two-thirds support for decision by two-thirds, and that's the maximal H you can find, then the supermajority will be two-thirds, et cetera. So it turns out the, uh, the H rule is the only initial constitution that is consistent with a very uh, uh, basic set of axioms. And again, this is, relates to reality. It's changing the existing reality, the existing status quo. You need, you, need, uh, you need the H rule. So that's, we have sort of a rational way of defining an initial constitution. Uh, so, uh, still open how to make it a constitutional amendment, a civil resilient, that paper doesn't address it. And also the question of on-chain governance is a huge, huge, huge question. Uh, those who are familiar with cryptocurrencies, et cetera, the question of on-chain governance of cryptocurrencies is a major issue. People claim to solve it and people others say that it's not solved and in general, it's not solved. And by the way, one of the reasons, one of the uh, consequences of lack of on-chain governance is forking, that people disagree and there's no, no way to decide how to change. If you want to change something, you cannot formally decide, decide on a change within the system. So cryptocurrencies fork and Bitcoin is forked several times, Ethereum forked several times, et cetera, et cetera. So on-chain governance is necessary and everything I've described until now is, can be thought of as building the foundational support to enable on-chain governance. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's part of it. And also uh, uh, forking, uh, it turns out can be also folded under the umbrella of, of social choice. And there is a nice paper uh, also with uh, uh, Ben Abramovitz uh, on, uh, on forking. And actually the rule is, is, the rule there is quite similar to the H rule, but formed, uh, formed uh, slightly differently. If enough people prefer to fork, provided enough people fork, then they fork, okay? So that's the democratic decision on forking. You know, it's not a social kind of thing. It's not fighting and, and slamming the door and leaving. It's a democratic process with a well-defined decision rule. And if enough, given all the alternatives and the deliberations, et cetera, and coalition formation and all this that happens before, if 
faced with the alternatives, enough people prefer to fork, provided enough people fork, a fork will happen, okay, democratically. Okay, so that's kind of wrapping up uh, the questions of constitutional governance and civil resilience, social choice. As I said, these are just proof of concept that the direction is feasible. There's huge, huge amount of work conceptually, scientifically, mathematically, and of course, computationally to, to, realize, to realize all that, but just uh, so we have a feel that this is uh, doable. Okay, so now that we're, the hard part is behind us, we can talk about the more easy stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, all this assumes that somehow, you know, we can bound the amount of Sibyls in the community. And Facebook, you know, is not that successful. Uh, and if we have here money and power to the people, you know, being a member of the community gives you power of control and also maybe give you uh, remuneration because the community is, is productive and wealthy, then the pressure on, on Sibyls entering the community will be, you know, that much larger. So the question is, what can we do? And how can we have an, a, a grassroots community grow uh, and still be egalitarian, not letting uh, too many Sibyls in? And uh, uh, this is a paper uh, with uh, Uri Pupko and Gal Shachaf uh, and uh, Talmon. And uh, it's fairly deep graph theory. Well, not deep, it's, it uses graph theory in a, in a fundamental way. And, uh, and the goal is to allow a community to form and grow indefinitely while maintaining bounded, bounded civil penetration, given a trust graph. And what is a trust graph? Here's the community. These are trust edges. And there could be trust between community members and outside members. So the applicants really want to establish sufficient trust. And once there is sufficient trust from people within to an applicant from without, then the applicant can join the community. That's the kind of general idea. So we have uh, agents and, uh, and, uh, and trust among them and uh, community members and applicants. Okay, so what are the assumptions? First, there is a trust graph with good connectivity and we use conductance uh, uh, to, to do that. And uh, second, that only corrupt agents trust Sybil. So you can think about this as a definition of a corrupt. I'm willing to give my trust to a Sybil means I'm corrupt. Otherwise, I, I would know that he's a Sybil, or maybe this is a Sybil I created. So typically, a person would create a Sybil and grant it trust, and this way, pull the Sybil into the community. And also another assumption, which is uh, uh, a strong one, but uh, we need it, that honest agent, agents trust honest, honest agents more than they trust uh, corrupt agents. So that good people tend to flock together, you know? That's uh, a strong assumption, and, uh, but, but we need it. And uh, again, th this picture, you see that there are three kinds of agents. There are civil identities, they're corrupt, which are real people. So they're genuine identities, but they are the people who support, uh, who have, uh, who have uh, trust with the civil is trying to pull them in. So we call the corrupt and the civil Byzantine and the honest and corrupt genuine, and there's some, some overlap. So you can have a genuine Byzantine uh, agent. And that's the main theorem. I will not walk you through it, just the English. So the English says that if we have a community history of the growth of the community, that the graph is bounded, you know, it's not too thick and not too thin in terms of the degree, uh, bounded from above or below. And initially the community is good. So you have a initial from in a grassroots phase, you know, you have people you know and trust and you didn't get, didn't let Sibyls in. And the edges between honest and Byzantine are relatively scarce. So that's what I said before, you trust, honest people don't trust uh, corrupt people too much. And you grow slowly, you know, not too quickly. And the conductance is, uh, the connectivity in the graph is, is big enough. Then under all these assumptions, we can have a bound on the civil penetration. So there's a big onus on the community to grow slowly, to check for conductance, you know, to make sure all these things and to ensure that its members don't give away trust for free easily. And under all these assumptions, we can grow a community with a bound in civil penetration. Okay, so that's a nice mathematical result, but how is it related to reality? And there are two 
fundamental questions that this mathematical in this mathematical world do not have an answer first is what where do genuine identities come from uh especially if we want them grassroots you know if we are trust the u.s government or some government then say okay give me your passport give me your id and i will know that you're a real person uh your your person with this uh passport number etc but in a grassroots fashion where do genuine genuine identities come from and the second is what does trust mean you know what do we trust and what happens when the trust is breached so these are two fundamental questions and uh, there's a paper that tries to answer them and uh, it's not mathematically very deep but for me even as i prepared the talk it's the most conceptually challenging uh, uh, issue because it's very confusing as computer scientists we like to think about you know the computational domain and say okay within this domain these things happen and but but here this is really about the connection between the computational domain and the real world and it's it's quite confusing so i'll, I'll try to to explain this connection so tries to answer the paper tries to answer two questions two questions where do genuine personal identities come from and what what kind of trust is in a trust edge okay and uh the first question is okay identity or identifier is just a keeper you know and uh grassroots solution uh we immediately you have to immediately think about this notion of self-sovereign identity there's a whole community or movement about uh, working on this and they have a, uh, um, uh, standards meetings and all that and they want to support self-sovereign identities and that it is controlled by people not by organizations not by commercial companies not by google not by facebook not by government so we're definitely in this realm except that they don't care about genuine identities you, you, they say okay you can create as many identities as you want for any purpose which is fine but that's not the question in democracy so if you want to, to, to a grassroots solution it's definitely within this domain and the if you think about the judge you know the judge that accepted the girl he said at the end of this discussion you know you, you hereby granted u.s citizenship okay so that's a speech act that's acting by talking and uh, actually i think the concept was uh, was here in berkeley i think searl was in berkeley if i remember correctly um anyway so that's uh uh that's the notion or i hereby you know you, uh, declare you husband and wife or or a king of England or whatever that's a speech act so uh, if you want self-sovereign identity the only way we can start is by a speech act of a person declaring that an identifier a keeper is their self their genuine identifier there's no other solution there's no other authority that we can rely on okay so so this is a real world event it's not a computational event and an honest person declares once that certain uh, identifier is their genuine identifier and a corrupt person also declares you know sibyls that's the difference between honest and corrupt people okay so that's the general concept and uh, I, I should mention that sibyl is a real world property not a, a competition one. it's a connection between the identifier and real people out there in the real world so here are some figures uh here's a corrupt person declaring many identifiers here's an honest person declaring only one and there's a big problem which i will i will skip because uh, i want to talk about other things but what if i need to if someone uh, knows my password if i lost my password i need to create another identity identifier but if i create another identifier i become corrupt so how can i create a new identifier without becoming corrupt we have a solution but i will not talk about it okay so that's the notion of genuine identifier and what is trust specifically what kind of trust do trust edges express and what happens when the trust is breached and we have a notion called mutual surety uh, which is sort of what the edge means an edge in a trust graph means it means mutual surety it has two components first the speech act i trust that some relation happens between a, a real person and an identifier on the other end of the edge and second, I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And here's the money. And if my trust is breached, I'm willing to lose that money. Okay, so that's what the mutual surety is. So it has a, a speech at component and a money component. And uh, the many, there are several types of trust. I will, uh, uh, I will skip them because uh, of lack of time. 
but I'll just say that each of them gives you more power. Uh, for example, uh, if I trust that you are the rightful owner of this genuine identifier, this, there is a leap of faith there because I trust you that you have not previously declared another one. I don't know that, but I must trust that you have not done it and you, you have not cheated me. And it turns out that this is sufficient for Sybil resilient community formation with random Sybil detection. I haven't shown you the, the protocol, it's in the paper, but you can do, if you have random Sybil detection with some probability, you can use this trust, this level of trust to achieve Sybil resilient community growth. For the previous uh, algorithm I showed you, you need even further. I trust you that you are honest and honest is much stronger. It's a huge leap of faith because I trust you not to ever declare another identifier generating, not in the past and not in the future. And that's the trust needed for, for the other paper I showed you before about community uh, formation. Okay, so we have an answer. Where do general identifiers come from? From the person from within by declaring. What does trust mean? I trust you. I trust some relation between this identifier and, and a real person, and I put my money on that. And it's grassroots in, in the sense that we, we discuss. Okay, so there are some limitations. First of all, conductance is a global measure, and it doesn't tell people what to do if they want to join a community. They cannot increase the conduction. They, they, they form specific edges. So really a local measure will be much better, but I pressured my graph people and, and they couldn't find yet a good, a good answer to that, but that's, uh, that's a limitation. And civil determination, it's a real, real property. It's not, we cannot solve it algorithmically. You know, we can, have algorithmic proposals for who is a Sybil, conjectures, maybe a first level of decisions, but you definitely need, definitely need a due process at the end of which people, real people, judges or jury declare if an identity is a Sybil or not. And for trust edges, we, mutual sureties, we need money. You put your money where your mouth is. But is there a contradiction between needing money and wanting it grassroots? What if the people who want to form a community have no money? You know, they're, Poor people, you know, in, in world today, the, the penetration of smartphones is much higher than the penetration of food. I mean, there are many places around the world where people are starving to death and they have smartphones, but they have no food. So we should assume that 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 grassroots really means, you know, in the in the broad global sense, grassroots, and they have no money. So how can we how can we have a grassroots uh, uh, formation if we need money well the answer is here it must be grassroots money we'll talk about that okay so all this detour was to show that we have a way to form communities which is grassroots and egalitarian assuming grassroots money assuming okay where are we uh, so we started a bit late i will uh I'll grab a few, grab some time from the questions for, uh, and go on. And uh, uh, where do you want? When do you want him to stop? No, no, it's good. I mean, we started like I think at least five minutes late. So. So you have how about five more minutes? Five more minutes. Yeah. Okay. And then questions. Okay. So I'll I'll do my best in the next uh, few minutes. Seven minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, democratic. We know about democratic. We know about grassroots. Let's talk a little bit about autonomous and members operated. So for, if we want autonomous members operated, there can be no third party uh, blockchains, no third party servers, no third party cloud computing. It should be serverless, which practically means smartphone based protocol stack. So I'll talk one minute about smartphone based and one minute about protocol stack. So smartphones, nobody wants serverless protocols. Okay, nobody, it's in, against the interest of any company on earth that we have serverless protocols. That's why we don't have them. But it is in the interest of 8 billion people that we have serverless protocols. That's why we should build them. Okay, and uh, okay, can this be done? Uh, first of all, about the smartphones and second, conceptually. Okay, so smartphones, I, I have beautiful photos I want to show you very quickly. Uh, this is the Ziskin building. Uh, where Shafi has an office, uh, and also uh, myself. And in 1949, it was actually the Weizmann Institute. It says here, Weizmann Institute of Science, it's the only, bu only building it says that because this was the Weizmann Institute of Science in 1949. 
this building. Now it's the Faculty of Computer Science and Mathematics. And that's Weizsack. It was at the basement of the Weizmann Institute, at the, of this building, and it was built in 1956. So that's part of it. It's another part of it. Another part of it. It's another part of it. Shackley occupied the entire basement of that building. And it was a very powerful computer. It's hard to get accurate numbers, but you know, it's a good approximate, it's a it's a um, generous approximation. It could do between 10 and 1000 K operations per second and had between 64 and 256 K. Okay, so everybody wants us to believe that uh, smartphones are not powerful enough to do what we need, that we need their servers and cloud computing and all that, but we can. And the second question, which I'll spend 10 seconds on is, uh, can we do a, 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 a serverless protocol stack? And the answer is yes, I believe, still a vision. But the point is that in such a stack, every application can be served best by the simplest possible one. So peer-to-peer -peer messaging, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook Messenger, we don't need their servers. We can do peer-to-peer. -peer. And even uh, personal currencies, we can do without, uh, without uh, uh, without uh, ordering, which is the, the full blockchain protocol. But if we need ordering, we can do the full blockchain protocol. It must be a DAG because it's a distributed partially ordered uh, causality uh, if it's an open network. And I will skip that slide. Okay, so I claimed without proof that it could be smartphone based and we can have serverless protocol. And the last thing is about members owned. So again, I will uh, just say that it is possible. You know, all the world wants this other type of money, but 8 billion people want this kind of money. You know, the rich people want the other one. The 8 billion people want this money, which is egalitarian and just, and we have some preliminary works on that. Uh, so uh, basically we can have egalitarian coin minting, not by miners, but by the people. And uh, that results in uh, just distribution of wealth. It's grassroots and civil resilient. And it gives a sort of universal basic income. Uh, so that's a paper by Shahaf and, uh, and Talmon and myself. And I'll skip that. And uh, yeah, this is just good things. The main theorem in the paper is a joint egalitarian minting, which means that everybody mints one coin every timestamp even if he's a member of several currency communities, but the person can choose which community to mint at every time step, uh, results in, in a global distributive justice. And uh, if there's enough intersection between the communities, there is also a one-to-one -one, uh, exchange rate between the different currencies. So it's, it's a workable solution. It's the first step. I don't think it's the end of the game. I think the end of the game is actually personal currency network, which is not published is something uh, uh, in progress, but. There are previous work on this. The Goel et al. has work on credit networks. And there is a trust lines a currency on community currency, which has these similar ideas. So again, this is work in progress, but I believe that the end game of this in terms of grassroots currency is actually personal currency, not even community currency. And I think it's workable. So you have to believe me that grassroots currency is conceptually possible and desirable whether it's community or personal, that's still, uh, we, we have results on community currency. Others have proposals for uh, personal currency. And, uh, and uh, I believe this is workable. And uh, the last thing is about digital communities. I will not talk about that. Uh, I'll just say that uh, this stands on the, on the basic concept of, of uh, social contracts. So digital communities should be viewed as the di digital incarnation of, of the social contract, but not Rousseau's, but Proudhon's, the, the first anarchist. He was the, he's the first person who was called anarchist. So he said that uh, social contract is a voluntary agreement among people. And we're talking about voluntary digital agreement among people, uh, which is realized and, and enforced by executing the agreed upon code. So it's a reminiscent of smart contract but it's executed by the people themselves, not by third party miners. So it's autonomous by the people themselves. Um, and 
many applications that should be designed this way, uh, democratic distributed autonomous organizations, on this, uh, social networks, credit unions uh, with community currency cooperative, digital cooperatives, association movement, political parties. If this infrastructure becomes common good, then democratic alternatives uh, based on it could be developed. And network I will skip, I will skip. So I tried to cover all these topics. And uh, as I said, the papers, those I spoke about and those I glanced over are in the archive. And I hope I've convinced you that the democratic metaverse is important, is doable, and lots to be done at the basic computer science level. Thank you very much. We, you, we open the floor to questions in the audience. Uh, other than that, anybody? Can you look at the okay? The Q and A. I don't have it in front of me actually. Christine, you have it. Uh, you have Okay, here. So there's a question here. Um, don't you think that moving to the metaverse is a way to dehumanize us? Even if some notion of democracy is achievable, I have the feeling that the more we digitalize our life, the more we dehumanize our very own nature, not to mention the effects on the brain changes and behaviors that come behind curtains with all these technologies. Okay, this is, uh, this is talking about the other type of foundations, okay? Uh, social, psychological, political, which I didn't claim uh, to make any contributions, but I have my personal opinion. And my personal opinion is, of course, I, I highly value real world communities. Actually, I live in a small village called Nataf in Israel, which has 500 people in it. And most people know most people there. So it's a true community and I highly value it. And still, I think that this community itself could benefit from better democracy. There's incredible discussions on how to manage democratically the community. It's a democratic community, but you know, arguing about how to do it, do we meet in person, do we vote like this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this community could benefit even from a community currency where, because there are a lot of inter-community people do babysitting and, and services to each other. So actually I think, I hope there'll be a guinea pig uh, for this. <clears throat> so so uh, that's my answer. Uh, th this is kind of um, similar. It's not necessarily computational foundations, but I was wondering what you think, like how are the like environmental impacts of the metaverse? Like how does this factor into everything? My idea would be sort of like, um, if we think about, you know, the energy output of the things we want to do, it's huge and that's uh, sort of- let, Let's stop here. Okay, okay. Okay, first of all, I, did, I, I, I held myself back not to talk about the energy use of cryptocurrencies. But I think this is an environmental disaster in the making. And if there was a, a, a rational world government, government, they would have forbidden proof of work, period, as of today. Okay? There are other alternatives which do not consume a, 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 so much energy. And, and, and I personally believe proof of work is a crime against humanity. That's it. And China, by the way, is the first country to outlaw it. And I think others, I don't think other countries should follow suit on China in other topics. But on this one, I think that's the, that's that's the right one. So that's that's the that, and and when I when I speak about you know smartphone based, that's one of the things. You know, it, it'll be green by by design. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that's the environmental impact. Second, I, I didn't speak much about UBI, but a, a universal basic income. But I think this, if this is successful, this will be the most powerful approach to universal basic income and for reducing inequality. Let me give you some examples. Uh, the main difficulty today with, with philanthropy is, is direct philanthropy. If you want, so much money is lost on the way, on the pipeline from the time it leaves the, 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 the pocket of the philanthropist until it reaches the, the final. Many, many people take their cuts along the way. But with such a system, with genuine identifiers that can be verifiable with communities that trust each other, you could donate individually, directly to the needed people. And don't tell me they don't have smartphones because they have. And maybe there is one per family or even one per village and it will work, okay? So it, it's the most efficient way. And if we think about personal currency, 
uh, it can be even more efficient than, than, than giving because let's say that there is this personal currency community out there in Africa somewhere, you know, and the Rockefeller Foundation wants, uh, wants to help them. They can say, okay, I'm going to buy one coin from each person every day for one dollar. Now, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, it could be that the price of this currency will go. If the pr price of the currency will go above one dollar, the Rockefeller to make do on their commitment, they don't even have to spend money. If the price is half a dollar, they still buy it, but they buy something that's worth half a dollar for one dollar. Okay. Uh, and if someone dumps their, their money in the open market and it goes to two cents, then Rockefeller can buy it for two cents. Uh, uh, so, so the commitment to buy one dollar from every person in a, in a needed community can give them, can boost them directly into a, a working economy, a grassroots economy with minimal outside intervention and actually with very little expense. So that's an example of what, 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 what this will enable, okay, uh, of outside support through a, 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 a currency, an egalitarian currency community with very little uh, outlay. Question uh, from the audience from uh, Moshe Valdi. What guarantees do you have that the democratic metaverse cannot be corrupted by the real universe? <laughs> okay. First of all, hi, Moshe. Uh, second, uh, I have no guarantees. As I said, the, the most difficult part is uh, in, 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 uh, conceptually and in, 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 in all these discussions is the interplay between the real world and the, and the computational world. And cryptocurrencies ignore it by saying, okay, we don't care about the real world. You know, everything is happen, happening computationally. And if someone can fabricate, you know, uh, 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 a random number easily, you know, it's there, good for them. You know, we don't know how they got this number. But here we say, no, we want real people. And, and, and real trust and, and et cetera, et cetera. So it's a, it's a difficult, uh, it, it, there's, there are no guarantees. I think the best guarantee is the grassroots nation, nature. So there's, there's no this monolithic metaverse which will someday collapse. There are all these different grassroots communities which emerge and maybe federate and, and, and grow together and they all have guarantees. And if some community fails and because it was infested with Sibyls and others will disconnect from it and the, the damage will be contained. So, so I think the grassroots is the answer to, to, to this uh, question. The next question is by Daniel, but there are many Daniels, so I don't know which one. <laughs> uh, and it has a lot of acronyms, and I, which I hope you understand. What is the existing DAO design the closest to achieving or adhering to these principles? Is there any SOK, a work that compares DAO designs? Okay, DAO is a distributed autonomous organization. And actually the first time I saw uh, a, a, nothing a, against these activities. Uh, I was even I didn't even know what DEI means. I'm the director of this. Uh, okay. Uh, so distributed autonomous organization. When, when the first time I saw uh, the Ethereum, the 150 lines of uh, Solidity code describing the first uh, the first uh, or simple uh, DAO for Ethereum, I was amazed. I said I had a revelation. I said this is unbelievable. And and actually the the beginning of this project said okay let's build something on top of Ethereum. Okay, and computationally it's possible, but it will not be autonomous. It will not be egalitarian. Will this community they will have to keep paying, you know, ominous gas prices for the for the third parties for the miners and will be under their control. So computationally, uh, from a computational point of view, a DAO can be programmed. Once we solve all these issues, a DAO can theoretically be programmed to address them. But if it runs on top of Ethereum. We've done nothing. We've just fed the beast with more, with more dollars, and 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 until they switch to proof of stake, uh, we also cause more and more and more environmental uh, damage. Yeah. Should I take the microphone? Sure. Thank you for a very interesting and uh, thorough talk. Um, I was wondering if I could. Uh, here are thoughts about maybe maybe you skipped over it or maybe I missed it. So this this idea of verification and civil elimination, what will that do to the uh, I think very attractive and essential ideas of uh, anonymity and pseudonymity in in 
yeah. virtual or non virtual is, is that just going to be a thing of the past now or is that can that is that unifiable with this idea of civil uh elimination because i think that is okay. still valuable even in a, a democratic uh, context okay. thank you okay so first of all not every community has to be democratic you know if you want to host a dungeon for some sect that's going to do obscene things in your dungeon anonym anonymously you can do it so I, I'm not claiming that the entire computational world or the entire cyberspace has to be democratic. I say we must give a solution for democracy and all the applications I described, uh, especially the, the commercial one, the kind of sharing economy, which really take money from people to, to the feudal lord and not sharing, not sharing the wealth. Uh, uh, all these definitely can benefit from, from democracy, but of course there will be communities that, that people want. And even, okay, let's think about this imaginary situation where a group of terrorists want to act democratically. Okay, what will they do? Well, maybe they will use them, their pseudonyms, which each of the, each, each of the other, I see now the, the Bureau, the French uh, uh, espionage uh, series. I cannot stop seeing it, unfortunately. Uh, so, um, so, Let's say they, they, these uh, terrorists, you know, they, they use pseudonyms that each, uh, each knows what the others, they can still act democratically. They know who, what pseudonym is the genuine identifier of that person within this context and still act democratically. So we can have, we can have terrorist anonymous democratic groups or oppressed minorities, you know, wh whatever oppressed minority is, as long as they use pseudonyms that they know and trust from each other. The next question is from Carlos again. He says, what are the possibilities to avoid civils altogether? Perhaps, um, so Carlos asks, what are the possibilities to avoid all uh, civils altogether, perhaps by a worldwide person identifier code, which is needed to post something to the metaverse? Yeah. Okay, th that, that was sort of the hope of many. You said, okay, we'll just use the irises or just use fingerprints or just use some DNA or something, but you know, there are so many problems associated with it uh, of uh, privacy and, uh, and security, and there is no way for this to emerge in a grassroots fashion. So if there was a world government and the world government would decide that everyone will get their ID based on their left iris from now and forever, it will work. But we first need this world government and how, who will decide on it? Who will vote on it? You know, how will we know that they voted democratically or not? That's a big question. So if you want grassroots, we cannot go this, this way. Next question is, what if instead, this is by Falcon Guy, what if instead of money, surely we institute a temporary ban uh, on the trusting person as a penalty? After all, membership in the community is a valuable resource. Yeah. Okay, there, there, are, many, there are many ways to, to, to uh, to do mechanism design, you know, as long as there's something that's valuable, it could be money, it could be trophies, it could be, uh, you know, sweets, whatever it is, uh, it could work. But we need money for other reasons. Uh, and, and I think my personal belief is that this, uh, I, I'm, I'm, still at, I'm still a minority in my research circle, but uh, my personal belief is that this will, the process will converge at personal currency. You know, that's the end point. The end game is a personal currency. Everyone will have their own currency and we will use this to negotiate and form communities and community currencies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's my personal belief that this is the, you know, you need your identity and your currency. And that's, these are the weapons you go or the, the tools with which you go to the digital world. So in fact, the next question was about speak more about personal currencies, but maybe we should skip to, there's a whole bunch of questions, which I'm also curious about. How do you get rid of Sybils? Say it again. How do you get rid of Sybils? How do I personally, or how? how... how what is your proposing? Uh, to get you, rid of you, Sybils? You, you, I mean, you, you have a lot of, uh, I, yeah. How do you get rid of Sybils? Well, uh, again, I, we, we've shown that mathematically a community can behave. Okay, you cannot get, first of all, you cannot get rid of Sybils, Good. period. Mm -hmm. You cannot. You can only create safe spaces or safe communities which prevent siblings from joining. They will be out there, you know, zillions, gazillions of siblings out in the, in, the, in the wild, but not in your protected community. So what I described is how a community can form uh, and protect uh, itself from siblings entering it. That's, that's the best that you can do. 
There's another question here about personal uh, coins. What happens at time of death? You know. Yes, that's that's uh, uh, actually a key question. A key question. It's 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 a fundamental question because really a personal coin. Uh, again, this is work in progress, so I don't have. Uh, but but the work in progress has treatment of that, and and. Um, a personal, a, a personal coin is really credit that other people give you. And uh, at the time of death, if you have uh, more credit than, than assets, then those who gave you credit lose. And if you're a productive person and have more assets and credits, then at the time of death or before, just before death, all, your, all, your, all the credit that's out there can be redeemed against assets that you have. And those who trusted you are uh, you know, uh, not in the red. So. But that's definitely, it, it's a fundamental question of personal currency, what happens in death, what happens in, in if you're insolvent. And these, these are, the work in progress, which has not been uh, published yet, is addressing this. Uh, maybe we, uh, we have seven more minutes, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, another question is, um, to what extent uh, do you think it's important for the metaverse to maintain a connection to real places in addition to real people? Mm -hmm. Movements like bioregionism and regionalism and transition towns stress the importance of defining computers in connection to place and material ecology. Do you think incorporating connection to a place is worthwhile extension of your theory of a democratic metaverse? Okay, so again, personally, personally, I'm, I'm a great believer in, in community, community life, and uh, community life in the real world. And uh, ideally, any if this works, and any community in the real world could have the tools to in, interact also in, in in the digital world as a supplement or as a complementary. So I definitely believe in that. And communities are autonomous, so they can decide that this community is only for the people of Nataf, and those who are not in Nataf cannot join. Or those are, you know, all, uh, uh, you know, uh, some group of people, the sports fan in the Jerusalem area. And only sports fan uh, can join from the Jerusalem area, not from other areas. So, so definitely, the community can, and I believe they would. There are uh, uh, sovereign to decide who who wants to join. I think the question was whether that's a necessary ingredient or whether it's, that's going to be an enhancing ingredient. That's somewhere. an enhancing ingredient. Actually, uh, <clears throat> one in in the early days, uh, you know, as a, as a lingering effect of of my my startup days, I I had a patent on. Uh, on uh, establishing communities based on their proximity. Mm -hmm. And I forget what was the reason, but we ended up uh, dropping it. And it's one of my most cited publications because all the other patents that are doing this must cite this uh, abandoned patent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, anyway, so it's, pr it's very important. Okay, uh, there's a question here is, uh, how much of the democracy that you propose is explained by the term self-sovereign. Examples are self-sovereign identity, self-sovereign date, and so data, and so forth. Well, uh, I have not invented this term, uh, but I like it, and and I think that the community that's wor working on self-sovereign identity is doing the right thing, in the general sense. But they're also struggling with governance, you know, and how would you govern democratically? So they also lo looking, but don't have solutions yet to, to this notion of genuine identities. So I believe self-sovereign genuine identities is, is fundamental and that's how I describe it. I also believe that self-sovereign personal currency is also important, but as of today, I'm in a minority in the, in the, in the team that, uh, that I work with on currencies. I, I speak with other people and they think, well, you know, so I'm, I, I, I'm, I, I believe this is also important, but, uh, but also the, the a key thing is the community. You know, a community is also sovereign in the sense that the will of the group is to decide democratically what, what to do. There are, two, there are questions here that are, I think two of them are related to each other. So one of them is by Dol Bitan. He's asking, why not solve it using the democratic real world infrastructure as they exist today? I have the countries where these companies operate, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, force the companies to behave democratically, share their profits, voting, et cetera. If the problem is civils, have each person declare to his government their Facebook details. I mean, and Facebook will only keep those accounts verified by governments. Yeah. So I could, the question here is why not use the okay. existing structure to solve the problems you're presenting? 
Okay, uh, when I started thinking about this, you know, several years ago, I actually wrote an article about how, uh, <clears throat> how all these uh, uh, digital uh, infrastructures that are emerging should be viewed as, as a common good and should be treated by governments as such. Uh, I think I'm uh, still a very small minority on, uh, in thinking, but as I said, th this is definitely the right direction of governments defending democracy within, within each country, but this is not based on what I, on the international nature of the digital, digital metaverse and the fact that we don't want to give any particular government, you know, veto power on top of that. I think that these are complementary uh, approaches. I think everything that's proposed is good, but it's not enough and it's not instead of a grassroots formation of, of, of a democratic metaverse. Okay, so there's two more questions here. Uh, today's world is not fully digitalized and governed. Birth registration is less than 50% in many African countries, uh, roughly 20% world population, which is, yeah. Will uh, the metaverse uh, sir, a concept presented today work only in tier one countries? So countries where there is birth registration. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, that, that's a big question. Uh, first, I would say that whatever happens with the democratic metaverse, it will be much better than an autocratic or crypt or plutocratic metaverse. And like the, the nightmare scenario was for India, you know, that, that uh, Facebook will be the internet of India, you know, that, that was on the table at some point uh, and rejected, fortunately. So I agree that global reach of, of, uh, uh, of connectivity and smartphones is, is a challenge, but first of all, all these satellites Satellite systems are, are, are emerging that will allow worldwide connectivity. And as I said, unfortunately, uh, and it's a very sad fact, I think the penetration of smartphones today in the world is, is, is higher than the penetration of food. And, um, and that's why this infrastructure could help practically, uh, you know, transfer wealth from rich nations to, to, to poor populations using this kind of, uh, this kind of infrastructure. And this technology can be made to work even if there is, you know, one person in a family or one person in a village with a smartphone. There are technology solutions to address that as well. Great. So now last question. Following up on the identifiers question, are there not good ways to design digital democratic institution based on full anonymity? Like, for instance, Wikipedia. Okay. The, the, the two separate questions. One is, are the people that are part of the community real people? And the second is, can their votes, can the anonymity of their votes be protected? And these are separate questions. And I think, of course, a democratic community has no choice but verifying that their people are real. And of course, a democratic community that wants their votes to, uh, to be uh, uh, not tampered with and not influenced by should find ways to have the voting anonymous. And fortunately, there's many smart people who work on anonymous voting. The technologies are, are still in development. There's no off-the-shelf solution that guarantees that. Each has its problems, et cetera. But I believe that, that uh, since they all, the, the, the solutions that, that work are based on trust. So, so you need some people that you trust. So if a community has some people that they trust, as the shufflers, the this and this, then the community can inside it ensure anonymity of votes so that the people that they trust actually do the, the, the anonymous voting protocol and at the end they have the result which can be verified without sacrificing uh, privacy. Uh, but this, the, any solution that, that uh, we come up with must not be a third party outside kind of contractor. It should be within the community. And I believe that the, the, the approaches that are being developed today can can be realized within a community that at least there are some trustworthy people inside. So uh, we're, we're out of time, but I'm going to ask a question. Yesterday, I was in an interesting talk where someone was talking about um, these fantastic uh, HCI ways to interact for musicians to do, make better music, more interesting music. And it turned out that this advance in technology uh, essentially introduced a disability in people that are not uh, which are which can't see blind musicians because you know some people are making much better music using interactions these guys can actually not see the panels not use those tools 
So of course, the solution is to make them also friendly to people who can't see. But it was an interesting phrasing that technology sometimes, and I never thought about it, can introduce a disability just in terms of sort of what is considered normal. Yeah. So <laughs> how does this relate to your talk? You know, there is this world, okay, where people um, are used to. And there's a lot of people, I think, that are not technologically enough savvy or part of the, you know, the elite uh, world or young enough. Uh, if such a thing took over, what, any thoughts about what would happen to those well, left behind? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a big question. And I mean, uh, taking a bus in Tel Aviv now, if you don't have, you don't know how to get the right credit card, is yeah, very yeah. hard. It's yeah. The, yeah, yeah, it's not even a credit card. It's this uh, automated uh, right. payment thing. I know, I, I, I know. Uh, I'm not pushing democratic metaverse as soon as possible tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I'm saying, given the alternatives, we should fight that whatever comes up will be democratic rather than plutocratic or yeah. Yeah. Uh, or autocratic. So, yeah, it's not your issue; it's all of ours issues. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, I, I think, but, but I think there is a huge penetration of smartphone technology and, of course, satellite connectivity. And it could be put to a lot of good. Uh, and even if only the young people have smartphones in the village, you know, and can, can know how to interact, fine, they will help the elderly. You know, so, so I think uh, we should work with what, what there is. And, and of course, as I said, I, I limit myself to the computational uh, part, but there are huge questions, uh, social, political, legal questions. Uh, uh, and and and, and uh, the, the types that you raised, which of course should be thought about and and, uh, and addressed. Maybe we should introduce a body system by age. Anyway, thank you, Udi, for a lovely discuss uh, talk and a very lively discussion. I don't know if you saw, but we had almost ninety people on, and you've given us a lot to think about. And thanks also for coming in person. And thank it you. It was very great, much. great to be here and to be with you. Thank you very much for all the real people, all the real people that are here, and the virtual people that are out. Thank you.